So sh shall I start? Yeah, go ahead and take it off, Kai. Okay, thank you for coming, everybody who is here. Resilient Hartford, who is sponsoring the Clifford Community, Clifford Park Community Food Forest, is a seven member commission of the town. We have been busy for the last six years working to bring the Hartford community together to engage in activities that increase the town's ability to deal with emergencies in the future. Since 2015, Resilient Hartford has, has sponsored workshops, presentations, a survey and work days, all geared toward bringing the community together to learn. In 2019, Resilient Hartford sponsored Potato Fest, which began in the spring with each of Hartford's five villages recruiting as many of its residents as possible to grow some potatoes. It ended in September with a big celebration potluck games, contests, and skits, all with a potato theme. We hope to hold a similar event in 2020, but COVID intervened. This year, we are beginning a project aimed at enhancing a public park, encouraging local food production, educating the public about soil health, and bringing together residents in a neighborhood. It is taking part in West Hartford and is called the Clifford Park Community Food Farm. Mm -hmm. It will be situated in a part of Clifford Park that is not now being used for any games or rec recreation. If we are successful with this project, we hope to sponsor similar efforts in some of Hartford's many other parks. We have hired two experts in permaculture and soil health to guide us, Kat Buxton and Karen Ganey. Both live in the Upper Valley. On May 12th, Kat gave <laughs> super interesting an educational talk by Zoom about enhancing the soil at Clifford Park. This was recorded and can be seen on YouTube at any time. I would encourage anyone who hasn't seen it to watch it. Tonight, Karen Ganey will talk with us about possible design of the community food forest and about species of possible plantings we might incorporate. Karen is the founder and designer at Permaculture Solutions, an ecological landscape design business where she designs gardens that maximize biodiversity and ecosystem health. Karen is also the facilitator for a teenager run nonprofit organization called Change the World Kids, where teenagers work on social, environmental, and food justice issues. Karen is a certified permaculture instructor, master composter and has installed edible and native habitats for schools, hospitals, and municipalities. She has also helped to found the Upper Valley Apple Corps and the Regeneration Corps, both community initiatives working toward a local thriving food system. <laughs> Take it away, Karen. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's always so interesting to hear your, ourselves contextualized in the work that we do. And I am so fortunate to do uh, work that I love and I feel really passionate about. Um, so I'm really grateful for the town of Hartford and the Hartford Resilience Committee and you all for being here tonight and um, hope that we can have uh, a nice presentation and um, some time for questions and maybe even some discussion. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, I'm gonna turn that off. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we are, um, Clifford Park Reimagined. Um, it's really a wonderful opportunity to have a community space that's already kind of held within um, the town to um, envision a way that um, we can grow food together um, in a creative way and a community process. Um, so thank you again for coming out tonight. And um, again, my name is Karen Ganey and um, I'm gonna take you through a little presentation. Oops. Oh, there we go. 
Um, so here's um, a little bit about what we're going to go over tonight. Um, basically, um, I do what's called permaculture, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is, um, just some definitions and examples. And then we're also here to kind of dive into a design process and look at what are the elements of design and what are the considerations that we need to um, take into a process of our design. And, um, and we'll go over a couple of the different kind of ways to do that. And also get into a little bit of like um, articulating the goals. What are we here to accomplish? And given that this is a community process, um, we will probably uh, have, you know, successional meetings where we're able to kind of dive into this a little bit more and um, do some analysis and assessment of our site. And then um, also define what goals can emerge from uh, what already exists. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, patterns to details in the design process. So we're going to start kind of with an overarching um, idea and concept and then work into the finer details of um, a process. Um, so, because it can be overwhelming trying to figure out what to do with such a blank slate, um, um, such as the, the Clifford Community Park. Uh, so then we're gonna go over some specific species, um, species that are really good for various and many ecosystem functions. And we'll also be defining those e ecosystem functions a little bit, um, but basically um, looking to increase um, soil health, biodiversity, and um, perennial food options, to name just a few. Um, so permaculture is basically a term that um, was originated from a fellow, an Australian scientist um, named Bill Mollison. And he traveled around the world and um, actually worked with some, a fair number of indigenous communities um, on holistic design processes and studying soil health and ecosystems. And the idea is, is that it stands for permanent agriculture, um, but I like to think of it as like perennial systems. So uh, working with um, plants in a way that um, works to maximize beneficial relationships between and among those plants, um, not just for the parts, but also the whole itself. Um, we're looking to create no waste and uh, maximize biodiversity and really, um, Oops, I'm just going to admit. Um, and think about ways that um, we can be um, intentionalizing um, uh, relationships that are mutually beneficial. And um, this system can really be applied to any um, practice or sector. Um, it's very holistic and rooted in nature herself. So we're really looking to learn from nature and with nature. I apologize. Okay. Um, so just briefly here, there's um, three uh, ethics and 12 principles that are kind of the foundation uh, of permaculture. And the ethics are earth care, people care, and fair share, or which is kind of growing into this concept of future share. Um, these are ideas that are still evolving and kind of being uh, incorporated in lots of different spaces. So this is not like a stagnant dogmatic system. This is like a living organic social system where we're also applying our, our lessons and integrating them as a whole as, and as a community. So these concepts are the basic pillars, um, but, and there's, but there's lots of ways to enact them um, and integrate them into our lives. And um, so, it, and it's, it's a great framework for figuring out like, um, you know, what is our, what is our orientation? What, which way is our compass pointing? Um, we're, as we know, coming from a system that is predominantly um, ruled by extractive and exploitative um, ways and means, it's really helpful to have a guide and a vision for like where we wanna go and what we can achieve as a community for like the health of all living beings. Um, so I find that this is a great framework for just to contextualize that work and, um, and give us, um, you know, great kind of examples and enthusiasm along the way. So why of permaculture? And I just kind of touched on some of this. And, um, but basically, there's, there's very rational and practical reasons that we need to be applying kind of permaculture and regenerative agriculture practices into our growing systems. And one of these um, important reasons is to increase biomass. Um, basically, storing carbon in the form of plants is one of the best ways that we can help to cool the planet and, and increase habitat and build soil all at once. Um, 
So that's a really important thing that we need to be focused on when we're thinking about our gardening and our growing systems and our community designs as well. Um, so connecting with nature's cycles, this is a part of reconnecting with ourselves and our inherent connection with nature, uh, which kind of gives us the tools to help relocalize our food system, um, get creative about what we're growing and where we're growing it and how we're growing it together. Uh, with a focus on soil. Um, as we've learned from last presentation that Kat gave, uh, soil is basically the foundation of all of life. And if we have healthy, rich, um, biodiverse soils, our, that, that'll be going into our food and then our, our lives and our practices, and we'll be able to um, enact some of the solutions that are called for in these times. And also nurturing community resilience. You know, this is a framework, again, that really provides a foundation for working together in a collaborative way. Um, in which so that we can kind of nourish and co-create a world that we're all excited about living in, um, that where everyone can be healthy and thriving. So we're gonna go over a little bit about a design process. Um, and so this is the basic kind of um, steps that we take as um, permaculture practitioners when we are uh, approaching um, any kind of a land design. And um, what's not listed on here, but that I do want to talk about is actually acknowledging the land um, that has been here and is, is providing home and habitat for us all. And the people that came previous to us um, in this area is the Abenaki people. Um, and part of this process is also um, reconnecting to the ways that we can create balance and um, nurture, you know, nourishing growing systems. Um, so I always really do start with a land acknowledgement um, which is when I'm approaching a piece of land and really what that means for me is really just connecting in with my heart and um, setting my intention and to be doing um, kind of no harm and um, ask to be able to um, work with the patterns of nature and be guided by uh, that brilliance that comes through. Um, so some of this in order to get to that place really involves slowing down. And one of the first steps in a process of design um, which is really to observe. And um, I would even start to um, add to this observe and interact um, because we are a part of, of these growing systems and um, they teach us a lot, especially when we start interacting with them. And a lot of the plants um, really have a lot to say and they can, they can teach us um, a lot about our surroundings. Um, so we wanna be observing that process, what already exists, um, what's already growing and what is nature's design already up to. Um, I think it's really important to take time to do this even throughout the seasons um, because things will change and there's a lot of reasons for those change and they're indicative of certain things. So we really wanna be observing and looking and um, interacting um, in a slow way. And, and then we wanna start mapping and looking at where's the sun in different times of the day? Where are the slopes and, and where um, are they starting and where are they ending and um, how steep are they? Where is the water flowing? Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? Is it running right off the landscape or is it really sinking in and being um, really uh, enriching the soils and, and nourishing the plants? Um, where are the predominant winds from? Um, this is really important because um, a lot of plants can be really drastically impacted by the wind. And um, there's a lot of ways to um, you know, really kind of protect and also create buffer zones and, and, and so-called like ecological barriers that provide really important habitat. Um, so all of these things really guide our questions and um, a process that where hopefully we get to a place where and sometimes a design really emerges. It kind of pops from a landscape once we start looking at these different zones and sectors. And so we're gonna be going over all of these a little with a little bit more detail and intentionality and hopefully in a process um, with other, you know, with this, with you all and um, with other people that wanna help to envision this space. So these are the elements, like I said, that we're gonna be looking at to create an assessment, like what is, what exists and what are the challenges and opportunities? Um, so what we know about Clifford Park is that um, there's really not a lot of organic matter in the, in the soils and they're pretty compacted. Um, we know that there is a great Southern sun exposure, um, enabling for the growth of a lot of different plants and species. Um, we know that there's a great running beautiful river right next to it. So there is some accessible water and there might be some challenges of like getting that water to the site 
and um, you know, accessing enough water for the growing systems that we're able to install. Um, but those create opportunities, um, of course, for maybe alternative systems where we can create some passive energy um, to get the water to the plants potentially. Um, so really we're looking at um, also the soil structure, the soil profiles, and wanting to increase that with diversity of plants and also the pathways of circulation. And this is a really important one where um, what I've learned over the years that I've been designing um, that like the path that we travel from like our house to our garden or compost pile or chicken coop or garage um, really informs a lot of like what um, elements we're kind of um, not only building into our life, but um, our efficiency. <laughs> So noticing these and building towards that efficiency is really great. So um, in, in intentionalizing the different pathways that will connect different zones of growing um, polycultures or guilds uh, that are then can be used for like, you know, multiple reasons and multiple uses. So this is a really exciting aspect of the um, analysis. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can have some fun with this, this one. And not only just human pathways of circulation, but of course also deer, birds, other habitat. Um, we know that there's a lot of um, you know, wonderful flora and fauna in this area. So um, these are the zones and sectors. And basically this is just another way of thinking about that frequency. Um, what are we, um, where are we frequencing the most? And of course we're, we're with ourselves, um, for good or bad, but always we're there. <laughs> and um, and then where, who else are we is in our circle of our family or community? Who are we kind of interacting with on a daily? Um, our homestead, these are places that we're on, you know, you know, in and occupying on a regular basis. And the garden is a place of sustenance. We're hopefully visiting that daily. And then we have shared ecosystems, maybe that we're not necessarily visiting daily, um, but maybe weekly or biweekly or monthly where we're kind of getting into other common areas. Maybe it's a community garden or a forest um, that's around the areas that we live. And then we have this um, zone five, which really embodies the more wild and intrinsic um, na nature elements. And these are places that are, we maybe don't frequent that we really value uh, for their wildness um, in, in that um, in that way. And so it just is helpful to think of uh, these different kind of variants and gradients of our, our, our where we're traveling, um, how we're connected to the different places and people and systems in our lives. Um, and then I kind of put zone nine on here. I, I come up with this one because I like to always leave space for the, um, the mysterious and the unknown to emerge uh, within a process. Um, so even in the perfect design system, uh, we can have um, some unexpected changes and also um, that can produce incredible um, beneficial results. So that's a little bit about the zones and sectors and um, the principles and ethics of permaculture. I hope it wasn't too much or too dry, but I just really wanna um, give context for of this process that we're gonna be doing together. Um, so speaking of together, um, this uh, probably one of the first steps for a design team that we hope to um, grow out of the uh, surrounding Upper Valley community. Um, these are just some of the ones that I've heard and we've seen um, and talked about already as a community, but this would be something that we can really dive into and articulate together. What are we really up to with this and, and what do we wanna create in a multi-use kind of um, growing community forest for Clifford Park? So this is our area um, and I think it's helpful to kind of contextualize within a design uh, working from patterns to details, or I also like to say the macrocosm to the microcosm. So I have just like a couple of categories to think about in terms of um, both like vertical height um, and, and horizontal spacing, but also um, time horizons and ecosystem functions. So how are we prioritizing what we really want to create? Um, an example of this is anything that is more long-term in the, in the time horizon um, and is also uh, would create like this, uh, a pioneer canopy, we can say, uh, would be the first things to go in. Um, so that would be like fruit tree species and um, things that maybe take longer to grow or longer to ripen and our potential kind of um, canopies or pioneer species for an entire guild. 
And so it's good to think of um, basically what we're, we're up to, how we can phase things from um, the installations of the trees, then and getting into the further details of like maybe more herbs and annuals and integrating those systems. But just to give us a sense of like starting points um, as we start to envision together. So I heard this recently, the saying, and I really can't wait to make a bumper sticker or a t-shirt out of it because I really live for polyculture guilds. And um, so if you guild it, they will come. And I think that this is just a, a little example of a really kind of diverse ecosystem where we're modeling our design based on what's already happening in nature. And if we look into a forest um, or forest canopy, uh, we see there's a lot of different species, a lot of different interactions, um, both vertically and um, or above ground and below. And what this does is it helps to increase that biomass storage I was talking about earlier and really create incredible insect reservoirs and biodiverse habitats. Um, and it also helps to um, really kind of check off the soil health principles, like making sure that we are keeping soils covered and doing so in such a way where we can stack our functions, which means that we can cover our soils with plants that are nutritious for the soil, nutritious um, for us and potentially draw pollinators and, um, and have multiple other ecosystem functions. So here's an example um, of what we call a guild or a polyculture. And um, a guild basically means a plant grouping that provides a certain function. Um, this could be drawing pollinators, it could be building soil, it could be edible or medicinal, um, it could be a nutrient accumulator. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of these in the upcoming slides as well. Um, but the idea is, is that we're kind of, we're planting our growing systems in a similar way that we'll, we'd see in nature. Um, and so the patterning is kind of sometimes it's, um, the spacing is varied and there's clumping. And what we found and what has been um, kind of proven over time is actually nutrient cycling um, does happen in a natural patterning, a branching patterning. So if we, um, and I, I have other slides and presentations where I really kind of geek out on this, but where um, that branching patterning that we see in roots, we see in our bodies, we see in trees as they branch is the most kind of efficient um, pattern for water and nutrient cycling. And so this is really exciting uh, because, I mean, you know, nature is brilliant and, uh, you know, we're connected in these ways. So I love kind of thinking about design in a similar fashion where we're not planting in rows, but maybe we're planting in kind of Y type fashions um, to, again, like increase that nutrient recycling. And so here are some of the ecosystem functions that we are looking to create with the plants that we select and choose. Um, and some of the idea is that, you know, certain plants will, will probably and will most, and most definitely, as you'll find, you know, actually um, tick off most of these boxes. They help to build soil. Maybe they have big, like beautiful broad leaves that we can do what we call chopping and dropping where we're kind of cutting it. And then it, it, we're able to use that um, leaf cutting as a, as a mulch. And then that plant will regrow actually multiple times a year, um, which is really incredible. So um, nitrogen fixing, as we know for plants to grow, they really need um, nitrogen to um, convert you know, sugars into fruits. And so that's a really important thing that we wanna be thinking of in terms of returning to the soil. And um, this is another way that I also wanna intentionalize uh, reciprocal gardening. So we're always thinking of what are we giving back? Um, you know, we can't just be extracting like vegetables and planting seeds year after year. Uh, we really wanna be like nurturing a relationship of building healthy soils and healthy plants. Um, pollinator attracting. So plants that bring po um, pollinators and uh, some of the design that informs um, these ecosystem functions is thinking about what are the needs of that pioneer species within a growing system. So for instance, what we know about the needs of a fruit tree gill or a fruit tree is that it needs pollination. Um, when those flowers open, uh, we really, uh, it, re it requires you know, insects to come and, and of course pollinate those flowers. So wouldn't it be so lovely if we can bring those insects with some of the plants that we can plant around those trees. And so there's so many plants that do that. Um, and so we think of what else does that tree need? And it needs fertility. So there's certain plants that we can plant that 
that have long tap roots that bring up minerals and nutrients from the subsurface up to like the surface kind of roots so that tree um, can really be nourished in, in good ways. Um, and same with water. So there's all these things that we're thinking about, not only like the inputs and the outputs that are needed for these systems, but we're providing for those uh, with you know, organic growing systems and plants that meet all these different um, ecosystem functions. So I love this image um, because um, one, it looks like it was drawn by children and I love, and I think that um, that's one of the reasons why um, we do this work because we can actually model, um, you know, new ways of not only growing food, but also community. So here's an example of um, an incredible amount of species that can be grown within one fruit tree guild. Um, and all of the things that you see around these plants are doing multiple functions, um, not only for the tree, but also for the system itself. And so we really, um, what I, and the other thing I was gonna say I love about these systems is when we were uh, with the Upper Valley Apple Corps partnering um, with the Hartford Historical Society, which kind of houses a lot of the Abenaki history and talking to them about nut trees and, um, you know, and, and incorporating growing systems, what we learned, or what I learned rather, is um, the butternut provided the, the kind of pioneer species for a lot of their growing systems. And they did have some cultivated fields, um, but they also grew a lot of their food around the butternuts. So bringing back this way of like ecosystem um, food production, I think is um, really kind of gonna help us lead into the future where we can be maximizing not only those nutrient recycling, but also nutrient dense food in small spaces. So we can really increase not only like our local food system, but our bioregional food system. Because once we start enacting these principles, the abundance is, is abound. <laughs> so, so anyhow, so here's some of the, um, there's just some great examples here. And as you can see, there's a mix of also perennials and annuals. And um, I like this system because um, sometimes annuals grown in you know, lots of acres and very open spaces are really more susceptible to pest pressure. Um, so growing them in these diversified ways um, can lessen that pest pressure as well. Oops, okay. Um, so here's just another example with the peach tree. Um, peach tree guilds can often um, kind of house a lot more diversity of um, some annuals because um, they often don't shade as much as an apple or a pear tree. Um, so there's, um, and it's really great to establish these gills at the establishment of the planting of the tree as well. So, um, cause as you may or may not know, sometimes if you, when it's, once a tree is established and is in, after 10 years, or I would say maybe 10 to 25, it really has an established root system that's not so deep in the ground. So it's harder to plant and establish um, guild species and companion plants around. But at the establishment of the tree, what we're doing is like all of those a stacking of functions that I was referring to earlier by providing fertility and bringing um, pollinators and um, you know, increasing like and mulch plants that will help with water retention and nutrient retention. So there's a lot of different examples of these and I put some together that we will go over um, because there are specific plants that we want to incorporate for very specific reasons. Um, because there's pollinators that of course pollinate the plants, but there's also insects that will come and eat the bugs that are eating the plants. Um, so these, what, the category of plants that we wanna to plant to draw those plants are called insect berries. And um, we're gonna go over some of those as well. How are we doing? Do we need a little break to have any questions or any pressing logistical issues? <laughs> I am so intrigued i i think you should keep going okay feel free to interrupt me if there is a I, I have a different request i wondered if you could go back to the um last uh two or three slides the the there stop at the at no the next one apple tree guild right there um thank you uh, yeah, of course. And we can, um, you know, this is, of course, recorded. And um, I can send you the slides if you'd like. I would like to receive these slides. Thank sure. you very much. 
of course. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oops. Um, so I love these images and um, basically because they kind of really help us see like, well, what is this, like, how does this all work and what does it look like together um, and start to really intentionalize the process um, for planting. Um, and there's a lot of different options and we're going to go over some of those options. But what I love is that um, when what I've learned in, in this process of companion planting and permaculture application is that some of these, um, what we're doing is we're shifting the paradigm because often it's thought we have to weed our gardens because those weeds are competing with the things that we're growing. But oftentimes if we intentionalize what we're planting next to each other, those things can really benefit each other. And the case, this is the case for strawberries and garlic. Um, so what they're finding through this, the edible agroforestry network is that there's actually greater yields of strawberries when, they're, when there's garlic planted amongst it. So I love this. And I think that it's probably, it's similar to the case with other alliums as well. And there's, we're very fortunate in that we have a lot of options for different um, and diverse alliums that we can grow that help to not only fumigate the soil, um, but protect species, you know, protect certain plants um, and also deter certain um, pests such as deer. Um, so anyway, so we're really kind of thinking about cooperation over competition. And so like, I hope you can start to see the themes now of like, what are really the foundational aspects of like holistic design and um, modeling from nature? And I just love it because it's, it's just cooperative <laughs> in design. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about nutrient accumulators. Sometimes these are also called dynamic accumulators, which I completely love. Um, because as you can see, they're completely dynamic and beautiful. Um, but basically what it means is these are plants that have tap roots that usually go down below like six to eight um, inches and or deeper. Like what's known about even like asparagus is it can send roots down to four feet or more. So these are basically plants that we know um, by the nature of that root kind of bring up minerals and, um, and nutrients and water to the surface level of the soil. Um, so we really wanna be thinking about where these can go and how to integrate them into our planting um, or leaving them. If for in instance, in the case of dandelion, you know, I strategically leave dandelions in a lot of places as they are also, they also restore calcium to the soil, uh, which is something that a lot of people spend a lot of money trying to put back into their soils after it's been um, grown on for long periods of time. And so um, I have docks on there. And by that, I mean like yellow docks and burdocks. We all have probably seen those really kind of hardy, deep roots that are um, really hard to pull up, but um, they're really kind of all providing a function. Lemon balm is one of my favorite. It's an incredible herb. Um, we should all be incorporating this into our teas and waters. I have mine in my water glass here. Um, but it's an, it's an, it provides a lot of functions, but and um, actually has a little taproot too. So it's doing those, that's nutrient water cycling. Valerian yarrow. I'm really, I love talking about plants and all of these have a lot of different medicinal value and ecosystem functions and we can completely geek out on them if you want, but I'm really just listing them here so that we can really start to create a plant palette um, that we want to work with. Um, and so there's a, a note about comfrey. There's a lot of, you know, in a, with a lot of these plants, you know, there's people that are passionate about the earth and plants um, can also can sometimes disagree. And comfrey is a plant that can be really hard to get rid of once you have it. I'm in the camp that I would say, why would you ever want to get rid of comfrey? Every, at, every part of the plant is um, medicinal and beneficial for both humans and um, insects and soils. And it can be a great mineral um, addition and nutrient to your to compost systems, um, but 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 that we and so but it does spread. So what we know is there's a couple different varieties. One which doesn't spread as versus the other. Um, so this variegated gold comfrey that I really haven't found too much of in this area, but um, it's good to know and think about, especially if we're planting in community settings. We really don't want anything that we plant to kind of like take over with more like in a way that like would then start out competing um, certainly native species. So anyway, I like to kind of talk about it and um, bring awareness to the different varieties that exist out there. So another, some of the ecosystem functions that we're looking to provide is one of the things I've said is nitrogen fixing. So a lot of the things that do this are in the pea family. And um, it's really incredible. Again, plants just kind of continually blow my mind. 
um, but they actually turn nitrogen into, into NH3, which is an ammonia that is that somehow it allows the plant to then be able to take up the nitrogen through a symbiotic relationship with the root bacteria. So phenomenal. And there's a number of different species that do this. So if one of our major goals is to restore soils and we wanna do that with plants, what we want to make sure we're doing is providing the things that the plants need to restore the soils. <laughs> so the connections, right? So these are some of the things, there's a lot of trees, shrubs and um, perennials that all do this. And fortunately they are very beautiful and also provide a lot of other functions as well. Um, and so, yes, I throw a licorice in there because, you know, there's all, it's not necessarily in this zone, but I never know if someone's going to be like seeing a presentation and say, oh, I could try that or somewhere else, you know, doing some kind of funny project somewhere and saying, oh, I think I remember licorice being a dynamic or, or a nitrogen fixer and, um, you know, to try to plant it because so it's amazing how much we learn from like just working with plants in the form of propagation or throwing seeds down or putting plants in pots and seeing what happens. Um, they really do have a lot to teach us and love to grow. So it's, it's fun to try a lot of things. And peanuts, we can certainly grow, grow locally. One of our local heroes, heroines is a seed saver who started Solstice Seeds. Sylvia Devats has been growing peanuts for a number of years now. Um, so it's really hopeful to think about the number uh, of different things that we can grow to increase the diversity in our own diet, um, as well as increase um, you know, this ecosystem health. So there's a number of different ground covers, um, some of which are edible, medicinal, um, also kind of providing insect um, habitat and drawing pollinators, um, and some of which that work really well together. One of my favorite combinations is chive, chamomile, and lemon balm. And because they all provide, they all have a different structure and are providing um, diverse amounts of leaf and flowers at um, long kind of long blooming perennial times. So, and they look really beautiful together. Um, and really what I find is in part of this process, um, and we, I do have a lot of um, books and information and knowledge about the many kind of specific species that just some of these plants even provide for. But what's fun is thinking about ourselves as integrating with the growing system as designers, because we start to gravitate to the, towards things that we really love and things that really kind of work well in a zone. And sometimes we'll have a design and then plant some things that don't actually really love or thrive in, or thrive in that area, but something else does. So it's a really fun experiential process to be involved with. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, and it really, it's a, it's a, you know, it, it's, our creativity, it's a place for our creative creativity to really shine. Um, so here's some other things I there's, I could have, I could spend the whole time just talking about shrubs. Um, over the years, as I've been practicing permaculture, I have found that there is incredible um, soil building qualities, habitat creation, um, berries and fruits for, new, um, for migratory birds that are all produced by shrubs some of which are very early flowering for early pollinators and um, berry producing at really key times. So I've grown to incorporate these into all my designs um, and, and have, um, you know, love, these are my top favorites. Um, Aronia, Aronia um, melancarpa is a nutrient dense, high antioxidant rich berry. It's the one on the top, it's the purple, purplish blue. Um, that is really loved and adored by uh, migratory birds. Uh, another one is the Viburnum triloum. It's a high bush American cranberry. And that's the one in the bottom with the red, kind of really brilliant red berry. And a lot of the, actually most of the Viburnums um, are native and uh, really can produce inc incredible habitat. Um, so again, we're thinking of like biomass. So like incorporating these like woody shrubs that provide multiple ecosystem functions into our landscape can increase um, not only habitat, but also like uh, the cooling effects. Um, I'm not gonna go into it too much for the purposes of this um, project, but one of the things that we often do is build out edges in permaculture design. So if we think of, for instance, the way that a lawn might need a forest, um, what the, we have the capacity to do in the form of like trees and shrubs and perennials and then ground covers is to extend that edge and create like different heights and um, diverse 
um, height with trees and um, shrubs and perennials so that it's really creating these like rich biomass sinks um, that is just like buzzing with life. Um, so all of these things can be planted um, together and also in multiple different kind of um, uh, soil types and habitats in the Northeast anyway. So this is just a start. And then um, some of my favorite perennials are the yarrow and the globe thistle that attract many, many different insects um, that and, and also have multiple um, uh, uh, functions by way of building soil. So this is what I mean when we think of our species selection and when we, we wanna select things that, have, that are doing multiple things. Um, and so we don't really plant anything that has one function or less. We wanna plant things that have four to seven different ecosystem functions. Um, so we're talking about insect insectaries and sometimes we say like, well, why bugs? And I think, it, you know, I've learned so much about bugs from actually the, the one and only Cat Buxton here. And, um, but it's just really opened my eyes to like, honestly, I think, and Kat, please feel free to jump in. Isn't it something like, like you know, only like 5% of all insects actually are somewhat harmful, <laughs> like, and or maybe- 1%, so uh, thanks, Karen. I'll, I'll just say that there are almost a million identified insects, argument about whether there are a million more, and 1% have been identified as harmful yeah <laughs> yeah like that i think i i you taught us in one of your presentations and and this is again like kind of along those lines of paradigm shifting where let's get let's get out of that mode of like seeing a bug and being like ah i'm like flicking and, and like you know throwing and slapping and like why do we do that but Anyhow, um, so there's lots of reasons for bugs. Not only are some of them pollinating our plants, or not our plants, but plants in general, um, but some of them are um, eating the larva or putting their eggs in the larva of other insects that are really eating some of the plants that we want to um, thrive. So unfortunately, there's lots of um, plants that kind of attract these insects. Um, so you'll see in some of these slides, there's listed, there's just plants that I've listed. Um, and again, like we can share the slideshow and I can share resources and all kinds of stuff so that everyone has their plant palette lists sorted out. Um, so, have, so, yes. Have you um, noticed in your work the decline of insects? I have been paying very close attention and I have found, like I have a certain patches of of um, trees and plants that like I have growing around my house that I'm like, for instance, all my comfrey just came into bloom and I always leave the first flowers of any perennials of herbs for the pollinators. Like if I, if it's something I also am interested in harvesting. So I've been, they've been open for like, I think at least a week now. And I haven't really been seeing a, a lot of bees on them. And I haven't really been seeing a lot of native bees yet. And so I am aware, I do think that there is a decline and, but then there's times where I'm like around, for instance, a rowan tree, um, which is an incredible, beautiful tree. And I look up and I can hear it just a buzz with life and insects. So I think that's why we have to really be planting a lot of these things for these, um, you know, this incredible insect world as much as we can. And what I pray for <laughs> is that because they're so little and they have such short lifespans, is that they can be there, they are also come back, they can come back readily um, because of the way that they they um, grow and their life cycles being so fast. But anyhow, I, I'm not an expert and I but I know that the experts are saying that there's yeah, there's a drastic decline. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just try to plant things like so I try to be aware of like what we want to be drawing in and then what we can plant to draw those things in. So there's the tachinid flies. Um, that are the parasites of caterpillars that are things that like will eat. Like, I don't know if you've seen the damage that like cabbage loopers can do to all brassicas. They're huge, they're fat and they eat a ton. And these tachinid flies will lay their eggs into those cabbage loopers and they'll die. So in some ways we're just like a tiny little part of this very integrated ecosystem. So with a little bit of intentionality we can help to kind of create balance. 
Um, and again, you'll see there's companions of plants like buckwheat is an annual cover crop, but even in these kind of perennial systems, growing systems, it's nice and it's possible and beautiful to put like little patches of buckwheat seed. Like I will disperse buckwheat seed in a perennial landscape, like right next to a lawn. And it produces these beautiful plants that then goes to seed. And if you have to, you can weed it out. And then I think over time, what we're doing is we're intentionalizing what we're pulling from the garden and we're not weeding it anymore. We're always harvesting it. So with this applied intentionality, this is what we're doing. And so this is, and also kind of the work that we're up to in this um, world of really needing to kind of incorporate um, climate justice, climate awareness, and just ecosystem health into our everyday lives. So um, anyhow, so planting little annual like clover, buckwheat, even rye, um, you know, these are things that are traditionally planted in kind of regenerative agriculture systems and large swaths. Um, but bringing them into fruit tree guilds and um, and just our garden landscapes in in ways um, can really enhance the entire system quite a lot. Um, so wasps wasps are other things. We have the um, trickle trichogramma and the rachnoid um, that we want to be bringing into our gardens. And like, look at these beautiful flowers that do just that. Um, so oh hum bum, like what a, what a job we have up uh, up ahead of us, right? Um, I think they're just beautiful. And some of the plants that draw um, the wasp, but also a lot of other pollinators are these like, um, kind of like, um, what are they called? The tower, like tiered, like the Veronica and the Bentony is the one that you see is kind of the fuchsia color. Um, and also lavender, like these types of flowers, <clears throat> but also a lot of umbiliferous flowers. Oh, I forgot to add that. Um, so things that have that very beautiful, broad, kind of open umbrella structure um, really provides a lot of insect, um, brings a lot of insectaries to our growing landscapes. Um, I think I meant to put some more pictures in here. I'm sorry, I didn't get to it here, but uh, pest confusers is another kind of category of things that will deter things like deer um, or that are very aromatic. Um, and that that's exactly what we wanna do. If something's coming to eat um, some of our, our vegetables, perennial or annual, we wanna be deterring them. And so broadleaf sage, yarrow, bee balm, chives, onions, mint, these all have very kind of aromatic qualities. So interspersing them in with our um, growing landscapes can really have great benefit. Um, so what does this look like applied? So we're kind of starting to come, again, like I said, kind of from that canopy now into more of the details of applied design process. Um, so we know about, I, and I know it's a lot of information to cover, but like some of the plants that provide some of the different functions. So now how do we integrate it? Um, so here's just an example of a service tree um, guild and service trees are some of my favorite kind of woody tall shrubs. And again, they really occupy that beautiful layer between like um, shrub and like tree uh, because they can get like some, you know, between 10 and 12 feet tall. Um, and sometimes taller depending on the fertility, but, um, you know, so sometimes it's a little bit lower than a fruit tree, but, you know, obviously taller than a shrub. So that's the kind of thing that we want to be thinking of in terms of our, like, um, you know, our height horizons and our width horizons and our spatial horizons. But anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful, um, tree. It produces an incredible berry that, um, like 10 times the amount of a blueberry, but it's, um, it's very similar tasting because they're bigger plants. They produce a lot of berries, um, nutrient dense. And they, I actually been, um, really enjoying, I buy them in bulk from one of the farmers who comes to the Norwich farmer's market. Um, and I've been making um, service berry pies and jam for a couple of years. And it's just, it really is a good berry because sometimes you hear these things where like, it's a nutrient dense berry and it's so delicious. And you go to taste and it's like, oh my God, it's so tart or so sour. And you have to mix it with like honey or maple syrup. Um, and, but the service berry is different. It's actually really authentically super delicious. Um, so, so anyway, so it's a great kind of pioneer species for some of these guilds. And, um, and it's, it's in the same family as apples. So it would be applied. So we like, have horseradish up there because it helps to repel some diseases and like rust and funguses. Um, comfrey, we've already talked about a little bit. It has that great um, tap root and is also um, really good plant for pollinators. It's medicinal actually is super powerful plant in terms of rebuilding um, uh, our, our, our skin. So I actually think it's amazing. There's such a thing called the doctrine of signatures that 
um, where plants in their, in their design and their shape will tell us what they're good for. An example is clover. There's a little kind of triangle in the clover leaf and it looks like the women's uterine system. And it's all, and that's exactly what it's really good for. So that's called the doctrine of signatures. And, but I also think there's another, there's, a, there's another way to apply that, which sometimes what a plant provides for the earth can also provide for us. So if we think about soil being the skin of the earth and how uh, long it takes to build topsoil and how much damage we've done, um, comfort is one of the plants that is like, is going to be pivotal in the kind of rebuilding of soil health. And it's also incredible at rebuilding our skin. So if we get a cut, a bruise and abrasion, um, it's so fast at rebuilding skin cells that if it's not completely cleaned of dirt, it could actually build those cells up so fast and cause infection. So we, you know, when we use it, we make sure that we're really cleaning the cuts out and then applying it. And it can, um, and it can also actually rebuild bones. So um, I've seen people that have had sprained ankles that were swollen the size of golf balls, soak their ankle in a big vat of comfrey, a thick comfrey tea, and overnight their swelling will start to go down. Um, like it really is an incredible plant. So I just love that there's some of these plants will help to heal the earth, but also really have incredible benefits for our uses. Um, there's a lot of berries that can um, really appreciate and tolerate some shade. This includes uh, gooseberries and currants and also elderberries. Um, so if the canopy is high enough, in the case of a service berry, it has this kind of multi woody stemmed structure. Um, it doesn't have the kind of single leading apple tree or pear tree structure. So it has a little bit more kind of light and space under the canopy. Um, then gooseberries and currants are really great for um, companioning under there. Um, and then there's a lot of different, you know, herbs. And again, as I said, there's certainly lists of herbs that are um, really good and beneficial for specific reasons, but you might also have some favorites and maybe the community decides that, you know, it wouldn't it be amazing if we can grow all the seed that we need, um, you know, for cilantro and just grow like coriander and save the seed and have that be a part of the project. Um, there's just so many different options and there's so many different varieties. Um, hazel birds, I think planting things that are nutrient dense like nuts and, um, and other things that will help to produce um, oils more locally is going to be really important in the future. And so trying to get these hazel birds um, incorporated into landscapes is so important. Yeah, three to five years, uh, multiple bushels of yields. It's a nut that isn't, isn't incredibly hard to crack. Um, and there's some really great uh, varieties. So uh, we've been planting these for probably about over five years with the Upper Valley Apple Corps and are starting to see some incredible um, plants produce some nuts. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's really, really important. And there's a lot of different, I mean, we're only kind of just touching the surface of the different varieties that are possible. Um, but I'm hoping that a design team can kind of look at some of these things with more depth and figure out if there's, you know, other things that we wanna be bringing in. And then we can get into um, some more um, lists with, for instance, nut trees. Um, so strawberries, they provide a great ground cover and um, of course, beautiful fruits and spring bulbs, you know, are not only beautiful and, um, you know, medicine for the eyes, as I say in the springtime after we come off of the long winters here, um, but they can help to repel voles and also kind of outcompete grass. They, the way that the nature of bulbs is, um, they grow so tightly together that they can actually really create walls and, um, and it's really beneficial to use them intentionally for that reason. Um, if we have some, you know, if there's grass that is potentially kind of encroaching in on an area. Okay, so here's another, just um, another polyculture guild. Um, and as you can see now, there's a lot of different variations and options for planting things together. And I'm just trying to give you a sense of what it could look like in design and what they look like in application, like um, when they're actually growing. For instance, in the bottom right picture here is a gooseberry. Um, which is a really, we kind of, we haven't seen the gooseberry and the commercial market, um, you know, for a number of reasons, but there's just so many fruits that we can grow um, that are just delicious and plentiful. And the gooseberry is something I'd love to see in every backyard. And it's just an incredible nutrient dense berry. And it kind of tastes a little bit like a mix between a grape and a blueberry, I would say. Um, currants, mulberries, all these types of plants um, are really beneficial and easy to grow and um, have multiple benefits for the entire growing landscape. Okay, so I'm just kind of wrapping up here and we're gonna um, move into some questions and maybe some discussions, but 
um, given that we're kind of in a process of just starting a visioning with this group and for community or the community um, uh, or Clifford Community Park, I just wanted to kind of uh, share some inspiration. Um, Peter Bain is kind of a, a well-known permaculture um, you know, a teacher. And I think that like, as we kind of move into the future, uh, how can we do so with vision uh, and creativity, I'll add to and frame whatever challenges we're up against, whether it's building soil or pumping water or you know, getting enough people to plant the trees that we really can frame that in terms of an opportunity. Um, you know, these are opportunities to apply you know, community scale, a human scale um, you know, technologies that can really create a beautiful uh, park. And so we design with the solutions in mind to meet multiple functions. Um, and hopefully we can kind of uh, design some of those in, in intentional um, goals as a, as a community and a, as a committee coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but that we can also learn from nature and really kind of look at the site and listen to it. Um, and I'd really, you know, hope to talk to a lot of the neighbors that are living uh, right around Clifford Park and are probably observing, you know, a fair amount of uh, people using the park, wildlife circulating through the park. Um, it's really important to be aware of these things and also thinking about how to incorporate um, you know, what we want to see more of as well. Educational opportunities, there's so much. Uh, and that, so we can cultivate the long view. Um, in the last one of the presentations um, Kat and I gave, we really talked about the history of the site and um, of Clifford Park, you know, even in pre-colonial days, um, you know, I, I suspect that there was, um, you know, fishing taking place and it could be really great to weave in the story with some of the um, Abenaki people that are here and, um, and also have this be a community collaboration where we're bringing in you know, multiple stakeholders to um, envision for a space that um, is better than we can even possibly imagine any one of us. So um, just to kind of uh, re-articulate, I know a lot of the people that are here for this uh, presentation were also the last ones, um, but we are in the process of um, you know, just about to um, make our plans and get digging. And so there's a lot of steps um, that need to happen in order for uh, this process to unfold. And um, so if you haven't yet kind of thought about where you would like to engage, um, you know, please kind of think about that and be in touch. Um, some of the next steps that as we see them will be formulating a design team um, that may or may not have overlapping participants of like the Hartford Resilience Committee but I imagine this team will also um, have some neighbors of the park, uh, potentially some students that are working with the Regeneration Corps um, or the Hartford Career and Technology Center, uh, where we can go through a process together and think about what we've learned and even and learn and explore a few more um, you know, methodologies that we haven't gotten into yet in terms of like, how do we do this? How do we install beds that build healthy soils? Um, and there's a lot of uh, discussion that can happen and take place around that as well. Um, and obviously, you know, it takes funds to do all this work. And um, fortunately, we are, uh, you know, benefiting from, um, you know, the, the experience and network of Kat Buxton and also uh, myself, but there's plenty of people on this committee that have a number of different resources to share. So I'm really looking forward to like working with you all and um, uh, seeing what we can really come up with together. Um, but we do have we do have some trees that have come through through 50.org that we can plant and um, we can be really creative about how we do this together. Um, so stay involved and what possibilities do you see? Um, I'm hoping that we can kind of go into a little bit of a question and discussion time where we can, you know, we can address any questions as they come up and also um, think about next steps and um, you know, and hopefully, uh, yeah, we have some ideas to work with now and maybe some plant species to help guide our way a little bit. So thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. That was thank you. really good. Um, Karen. So let's, uh, let's stop our screen share and yeah, open it up to discussion. Um, and for the recording, I'll put it in gallery view. And I think we're a small enough group. Um, we can just unmute and ask our questions. Who's 
got a question. Um, well, maybe some amount of hand raising or something, but <laughs> Frederica. No, I, I don't at this moment have a question. Um, I want to thank Karen. It's been wonderful. And I uh, look forward to receiving those um, uh, slides to receiving the recording so that um, I can study it better. Awesome. So you, uh, well, actually this can formulate into a question. Um, you have shown us so many possibilities. Have you yourself drawn up any um, sample designs for the space? Or are you oh, I have, yep. Yes, I did do a little bit of a, um, a you know, kind of a little mock-up to see, just to show like what is possible with the space. What are you doing with that? Uh, well, what I would hope to do is kind of, if people are interested in design, like how to apply some of what we've talked about tonight, um, I'd like to schedule another time. Um, I'm actually, I'm leaving on Saturday for two weeks, but when I return, um, what I'd like is for a, a, people that are wanting to kind of learn and apply these principles into a design framework. And what we would do is create what's called a base map um, and start to really get some specific measurements and then design within that framework. And we'd just basically go through that process that I articulated a little bit in the show, the slideshow. Um, we would look at where the sun is in the morning, you know, midday, late day, um, maybe, you know, like where the soil might be more compacted, where the, where the prevailing winds coming from, um, this type of thing. And then once we kind of, then we map that onto what we call our base map. And then we can start a process of like really just kind of bubble mapping. And what I do is I draw circles and I say, okay, dry, shade, um, moist kind of, or, or like if there's something growing in the area like sumac and just to kind of map out those things. And then I can start to think of the possibilities. So, um, you know, I imagine there's given what's been shared and what's already been kind of discussed in terms of it would be great to see like there's a lot of interest in like fruit trees and community gardens um so you know we can start thinking about what species varieties like peaches or pears or plums or should we talk to john and donna moody and say you know do you have any recommendations or would you be interested in like helping with some species selection for this site to kind of build those relations and like make sure that we're kind of you know working in alignment with everyone um so that would be the process. And anyway, so I would like, there could be a committee of like two, three, five, or 10. Um, and then what we would do is ultimately create a plan um, that would be a design that we would then kind of put forward as a proposal to Dylan and the parks department, and it would need to get approved by the town. Um, but even before that, what I actually, I skipped one step in that process. The committee would then come up with a design and then present, oh no, well, we would think about it. I think we have to we either, we put it to the community so that the community can kind of go around and think about it more. And then the community comes up with the, the final design that goes to the town and the town comes back. It's all a cyclical process. Anyhow, does that make sense? Is that, does that sound intriguing to anyone? Is anyone like, you know, I've been hearing about permaculture and I really just kind of like wanting to apply it or I really, I love Clifford Park and I've been seeing that this mulberry could be like so beautiful right here. And I'd really love to see that. Or my family does a traditional gooseberry pie every year and we really wanna plant those gooseberries to make a pie for our Memorial Day, or no, I guess it would be gooseberries. It would, whatever, whatever holiday comes in midsummer. <laughs> uh, Karen, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. How can you, uh, size the design without knowing how many volunteers we're going to have that will be providing continuity. Uh, I know, that's work. why I put that slide in there it says, if you gild it, they will come. You see? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's a great question, John. I think um, we really need to build this at a human scale and a human pace and not get too far ahead of ourselves. So what we see kind of happening as a timeline is coming up with a design probably like end of July-ish, which would probably mean two meetings, um, two or three meetings throughout the period of July. Um, and, you know, and then growing it to the scale that we can within the group that can. So 
Um, we think we're imagining maybe like at least a plant, like maybe one planting party in the fall um, and or and also building beds. Like one of the great things, and we didn't get a lot of time in this presentation to talk about it, but one of the, the other bumper sticker t-shirt that I want is, is going to say sheet mulch it <laughs> because I've seen in the, the, really the most incredible soils. There's a methodology. It actually takes waste out of the waste stream by way of, you know, cardboard collection. And currently right now we were shipping our cardboard to China for reprocessing. It's not happening anymore. It hasn't been happening for over five years. So it's going to Canada, but there's an over, um, and like an overabundance and especially now people at home in the pandemic and ordering all these cardboard boxes. Anyway, I try to repurpose them and get them out of the waste stream. Um, it helps to really aerate the soil, lay cardboard, and then start layering um, compost and wood chips. And within, if we did that in the spring, we can plant into that fall and all that grass and biomass just dies uh, underneath and it creates a really great planting bed. Um, I know you asked about people and I'm talking about, still talking about permaculture soil methodology, but it does relate because what that means is it actually takes a lot less labor to either remove sod or plant trees because what we're doing is we're creating a perfect bed for planting into. And it takes like probably half the time of digging if we do that in that, prop, in that way. Um, so all to say we can do a lot with a small amount of people. Um, and what we're really hoping to do is really work at work with and network with like the Hartford Career and Technology Center, the Regeneration Corps, which is a community led project to connect kids um, in getting evidence based or credit uh, by working um, with regenerative farm projects. So the idea is, is that we're, there will be a place for everyone to be involved. And we just have to trust that the right people uh, will come and the right outcomes will come from that. Well, you have <clears throat> fascinating ideas. <laughs> and I can see how you could uh, ensnare quite a few different types of people into this, which I which I hope is uh, is going to be the case. Um, okay. Is it possible to to ladder the process so that you start with, say, uh, one building block, maybe a single tree? <laughs> yes. And then, yeah. as people get involved you expand it. Yep, exactly. I think that's great. And part of the design team, what that role will be, and I, I do see if Kat has a hand, and if anyone else has a hand, please raise it and we'll get you in, make sure we have time there. And Frederica, okay. Um, but what the idea is, is, oh shoot, I forgot my train of thought, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I think that at the, team, oh no, I know I was gonna say, the design team basically lays out the phases. So, okay, it says, here's the concept and here's the phasing. So that as people come and get involved, they see, okay, we're in phase one. Phase one is design. Phase two is, is installation. And phase three is, you know, phase two of installation. So there's a process that's really well articulated. So it really can embrace newcomers, but also keep the interest of the group going so that we're kind of always co-learning and co-installing and working together. Yeah, I like, I like that design. Okay. Yeah. Phasing, I think is really important for budgetary reasons too. Okay. Kat and then Frederica. Um, thank you, Karen. This presentation was so inspiring and I learned stuff. This is so great. Um, and I, I want to say um, in terms of cardboard, um, if I turn my camera around, you would see that the land we just purchased is covered in cardboard right now as we are building soil on a pretty poor soil. Uh, and that's exactly what I do is I pull off the tape and the staples and I lay down the cardboard and I layer on soil materials. So that is our plan at Clifford Park. And we have a building on site to store cardboard until the tape has been removed. Um, and I also am a big fan of starting small and moving at the pace of the relationships that we build. We can start with one tree, but it would have to be one tree and one guild. That's right. <laughs> right. And yeah, so I'm really excited uh, yeah. about that. Yeah. And I mean, these are things that like, and it is really fun. I don't know if you all have done much dumpster diving in your, in your days, but I will tell you something. Um, it is, it's, it's an experience and it's, there's a lot of fun to be had there. And if we have a place,
place to store it. That's one way we can say, start collecting cardboard, you know, and ultimately what happens if I work with businesses, sometimes they'll leave it out for me. So I don't have to actually dump in the dumpster, which is always nice. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's, we can, this is exactly what we need is to start kind of thinking, what do we need to do? Okay. Like wood chips, cardboard, essential. And, and we then, haven't, we haven't figured out a designated place for that cardboard yet, have we? So I would love to be able to take mine right now and just drive it up there on, on occasion. But yeah, that would be awesome. I think Kat was just saying we can, you know, I know Dylan has given yeah. us the green light to use the barn. Yep, I have the key. We have a building. We just have to coordinate, absolutely. Cool. Hey, <clears throat> that has to do with my question too. Um, okay. Ashton, there, we have a working committee. We meet at least once a week. It's Kai and Marsha Artilio and me. And we got, we're making these baby steps to go forward. Right now we're working on a trifold to describe this process the best we can to put into the Clifford, uh, sorry, West Hartford Library to alert the people of, that, of the community of West Hartford that this project is going on. And if anybody would like to join us three, we would like to expand and be able to, um, do such things as you mentioned, Ashton. I have a number of cardboard boxes from the co-op and an X and a, um, a source of compost that needs to be picked up in someone's truck. But I don't have a truck, but I would like to um, pick up that compost and get it out to Clifford Park. But I feel like I can't do it on my own. And the three of us, uh, we need help. So if anybody would like to be on this steering committee so that we can call on you um, for whatever, you know, uh, resourcing materials and getting them out to the park or ongoing um, uh, advertisement, publicity. We are also in process of making flyers to put up in all the libraries and other places about this project. So the more people that we alert, the better, but also especially the um, West Hartford community because they're the ones that are gonna be direct beneficiaries of this particular park. Okay, thank you. Awesome. I'll, I'll just put out there that I have a, uh, I've got a pickup truck that has very, you know, I never use it. Um, it's definitely available. Thank you. I'm available too. Yay! Excellent. Ashton. Uh, you had mentioned that someone or that you know of instances of people being able to like dunk their feet in com uh, com comfrey. Is that what it is? Comfrey tea? Oh, yeah. yeah. If you had a sprained ankle or something, that's what you should do. Yeah. Can you like fill a bath with something like that and like solve back issues and things like that? Or is it is it more of a small joint kind of thing? It's actually um, joint, bone and ligament and skin. So it's kind of a power packed plant. And what you would need to do is infuse it like a tea. So think about like, if, think about like if you were a giant, like, you know, a big old giant making a big cup of tea, it'd be the same thing, but you'd be like make a big pot, bunch of comfrey leaf, warm that water and don't boil it, but just simmer it on low for a bit. And then all those constituents go into that water and you could put, yeah, but like a bath, you could probably get it high enough to do something like that. Um, yeah, and there, the leaf is, um, has a little bit of a prickly, um, sticky um, nature to it and, but so what I would maybe do if you wanted to do a bath, like if you get into kind of a cheesecloth sack or something like that, so you, it doesn't, it might, cause it might have a tendency, it does like stick a little bit on your skin and clothes sometimes. Sure. Yeah, cool. but it's great plant. Great. Um, any other questions or thoughts or hopes of having learned something else or, <laughs> yeah, John catch up with you here. There we go. So one of the things I just want to point out that one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about is a couple of the plants you mentioned are on Vermont's invasive species watch list. Oh, and, yeah. and, and so um, I, I think we ought to be thinking pretty seriously about which ones we want to use. So I did notice autumn olive. Yeah, great nitrogen fixer. Um, 
again, it's not risen to the status yet where it's actually forbidden to be moved, but it's on a watch list. Yeah. Um, another one is actually, I think, I'm, I'm, let me double check here. I'm going to skin down through here. A common garden valerian. Um, Valeriana officialis. Yes. So I'm going to put that out there. I don't, and I don't know anything about it other than what you've told me about it and that it's on an invasive species watch list. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you bringing it up. And actually there's a lot of dialogue and discussion and really important discourse to be had. Like I kind of envision these Venn diagrams of like, you know, the native and, and the permaculture plants and um, the valerian does spread. I, I doesn't, it's not nearly as bad as something like um, burning bush or not weed at all. Um, and autumn olive is, there's an edible berry associated with it. And I, I know that it's on the watch list and it's something that we should definitely like be aware of and also be educating about. Like, are there ways that we could be, like if one of the reasons that I put autumn olive on the list is to encourage people to harvest and eat the berries and that prevents the spreading. So if we can basically like create like cultural use practices where we're like harvesting in such a way that's also keeping things at in a, in a uh, reasonable kind of management situation, I think is really important. And we have to be talking about that. Um, and I'd much rather like create spaces for having that discussion than like saying like really kind of like hard and fast nose to certain things. And like, cause a lot of times like sea buck, sea berry people think is another invasive variety, but it's not, it's a different, it's a whole different plant in its own. And it's nitrogen fixing and incredibly nutrient dense. And, um, and it has a great berry, but so yes, thank you so much for bringing those up. And we should absolutely be very aware of um, like what the growing patterns of all the plants that we bring in are. Yeah. Um, let me let me just say then that that um, you know I think there is this will be controversial. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think Let's there's also ahead. the opportunity to have discussion about the use of um, herbicides such as glyphosate. Um, oh no, is, we can't have glyphosate. Oh, we can have a conversation about it. If we can have a conversation about if we can have a conversation about using um, plants that a number of botanists and ecologists have pointed out are invasive, then we certainly can have a discussion about whether we can use uh, the chemical glyphosate and other chemicals to control those noxious weeds um, to keep them from overwhelming our native ecosystems. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, uh, thank you so much. I do think that we have to have the dialogue and um, and we have to think about what does it mean? So there's a lot of things that are naturalized now and it's important to think about um, how we're working with those plants that are naturalized. We're never gonna go back to a world without Japanese not weed here. And there are billions of dollars you know, being poured into trying to remove species and like eradicate. And I think that we need to think in systems, like we're not gonna do that. Like, are we all gonna, like I have European ancestry, am I, I'm not native, am I? Like, so how, how are we thinking in patterns that are kind of working towards diversity? And, but certainly there are things that we want, we do, we do not wanna plant anything that's gonna, you know, suck up the water table or, you know, take away things or, you know, there's certain, the nor, what is it, Norway, uh, Norway maple, like there's certain species that we, we have to educate ourselves and have discourse around. And what we do is we recognize without judgments and say, if this, then this, if this, then this, um, like, okay, so I'm going to try to outcompete the gout, outcompete gout weed with watercress. And then I have so much water, you know, like there's a, there's a cause and we have to be aware of that. And we're interacting with nature. So we have to very much be careful of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's why we build in so much intentionality. And I'm, I'm not, I plant a lot of natives, but I also have, I know, and I've gotten, become very, very good friends with lots of plants that are not traditionally native to this area. We're an evolving species. There's herbalists out there. And I believe this to be true hearted too, is that when we're connected to the earth, um, you know, sometimes within a couple mile radius, there might be herbs growing that are good for us and, and, and are trying to reach us and connect to us. 
Are they gonna be native all the time? I don't know, are they naturalized? Yes. So it is an important discussion to have and, and like keep asking questions. And But if we can educate ourselves on the growing patterns and the relationships of plants and be like really solidly grounded in what we're doing and why we're doing it, then I think that we might just come out with a little bit more kind of diversity and um, uh, other perspectives. We have to be willing to learn with each other and with, from each other and um, work together, even though we're not going to all agree on things. But as, certainly as a community process, what I trust in democracy and community process is great. If we're not going to plant, um, you know, valerian because it is on that watch list, let's not do that. And let's decide that together because certainly that's what democracy is for. So that no one person is coming in saying, we need five acres of sea berries. Like then we have to go back and forth with each other, ask good questions. Why? That's not diversity. You know, like how many, what are the trade-offs here? What are the benefits? So yeah, anyway, I don't want to go on and on, but collaboration over competition, you know, informed discourse um, over conflict. You know, these are things that really we can embody as a community and really where the power of the process is. So yeah, I, I love it. I'm, and I'll, let's have that discussion. Absolutely, especially about certain things. Um, okay, so we're kind of, we're approaching the eight o'clock hour. Um, Brian, did you, did you have a question? It, I probably shouldn't even ask it right now. I should look it up. But, but this autumn olive that you're talking about, we have a new bush that's coming up a lot on our land. And it's, it looks a lot like, sort of like Russian olive. Is that autumn olive? It was just blooming really recently. And yeah, it probably is, Kai. I was there not just actually Monday, and I, I noticed it. I was walking around, and I was like, oh, wow, you have autumn olive. Okay. That's yeah, like if you're going down past like towards the river totem pole area on the left, there's some, yeah, right there. And there's in a lot of other places too. Yeah, so it's so good to watch that pattern and get the berries at once they're ripe. So the berries are good. Yes. Interesting. Yes. I, was I tried to make an eyeshadow because under the leaf is really silvery and it has a really beautiful kind of like mica kind of silveriness. So. Last year, I tried to rub the leaf and it, it barely comes off, but I feel like with a little bit more work, we could probably figure out how to make a really cool <laughs> natural eyeshadow. Um, I digress. Before we close, I, I think I saw Laura raise her hand at some point. No? Okay. So to be continued, I'm, can I just get a sense? Dylan had a drop out and he apologized, but he said he's interested in being on the design team. Is there anyone else on this call that would like to be a part of the design team? Awesome. So I'm seeing Kai. John, is that your hand too? Yay. Oh, Becky. Awesome. This is a great start. So Kai, John, Becky, Dylan, Laura. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I don't know anything about design? It's great. Yeah, so again, like more perspectives, especially fresh, you know, fresh eyes and green knowledge, as we say, is really, really good. Um, okay, well, this is a great team. Kai. Uh, if you have yeah, interest but... in grounds uh, uh, resource accumulation, um, I'm interested in that. And how oh, yeah. Could... I will be calling you John, and I think also Ashton to um, coordinate getting the materials out there. That's great. Yeah, and we can start bringing cardboard. So what the best process cardboard. for that is, it sounds like maybe an email to Kat or a text message if you have cardboard that you want to drop off. Yeah. Does that work for you, Kat? What would be best is um, if we can coordinate a day where we can all meet up to drop our cardboard off and we can even try and formulate a regular thing, but um, let's work that out in committee details. I have the key, so I will need to be there. Um, yeah, but we can work that out. Okay, great. Yeah, that's great. A perfect committee so, thing. So yeah, but this is great yeah. that we're already starting to think of our next steps and what's needed. Uh, okay. Um, we also, just so everyone knows, we do have some promised wood chips um, coming from Dylan and the Park and Rec 
uh, from a project happening on Jericho Hill. So um, cardboard and wood chips will get us started. And that everything else is wonderful. Too. Yeah. That is great. Um, Someone else is joining us. I know, I just. Just as we're leaving. Hi, Joan. We're just about to close. I'll leave it to and, you. Oh, just another quick logistical thing. Is everyone, how do we know that everyone on this call, if this is their first call that you've been on for this project, um, if you want to get on an email list to be informed of the process and the next steps, um, I guess please put your email in the chat and we'll add you to the um, Clifford Community Park email list. And I think the next thing that we have coming up do is um, is actually just for us to decide, our, our, the, I'll be in touch with the design team and we'll get a date on the calendar to start going over that process a little bit. Does that sound good to everyone? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And, if you, and uh, if you have any questions that you think of later, please feel free to email um, and stay in touch about that. Our questions rather. Yeah, well, thank you, Karen. This was great. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Bye, Karen. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Ashton. We'll get the recording out as soon as possible. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Great. everybody. Thanks. Good to see awesome. you, Suzanne. Hi, good to see you. <laughs> we'll, have to do our, we'll have to do a tour of your, your biodiverse site there with the team. The no, this was really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>